go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kuder, local realtor here in Ottawa, and I'm joined today by probably one of the funniest folks I've ever met in the Come city, okay. Todd Van Allen, who is actually performing nowadays at Absolute Comedy, right. came from Toronto, moved back to Ottawa, I believe, mm-hmm. about what, uh, two years ago, right mm-hmm. in the middle of 2020. pandemic. Right at the top of the pandemic, which, as I as I say on on stage, we moved at a time when we didn't know how it was going to kill you yet. Yeah, so that yeah. is so it was just crazy. Like we moved, shutdown happened in March, and we moved in May. It's crazy, man. Yeah, and that's that's a time like it was just a complete uncertainty. Nobody mm-hmm. knew what's going on. Nobody right. knew if it's gonna like you said, right. it's gonna kill you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> People who are washing their own. You know, groceries. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, we were lemon wiping the dog, pineapples in the yeah. dishwasher. Like, that's how. We lived. And you had to sell your house at the time, too. So that, yes. tell me a bit about that experience. So, I lived in Toronto, like, half my life. I grew up in Gananoque, Ontario. My wife actually grew up in Ashton, just outside of, uh, just outside Place, of Ottawa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, between Carlton Place there. And so, we decided to move for a few reasons. This was before the pandemic was even a thing. And uh, one, of, one of the key reasons was her work. It was kind of making her travel back and forth. And so we we're hardly seeing each other. So mm-hmm. that's not great. Uh, and both of our parents uh, are in the area and live there of an age right now where it would probably make sense to be in the same area code, yeah. if you know what I mean. So that's, that was the motivation for the, makes sense, for, yeah. for, the, for, the, um, uh, for the move. And so we really lucked out. Like there was, there was at the beginning of the pandemic, at the beginning of the lockdown, there was a scramble in the Toronto market. So everything just, I I don't know why people went, oh, we have to stay inside. Well, we might as well move, right? Like, I don't know what happened. Same thing happened with the cottage markets and everything. So it just, it went crazy. We sold and then we bought just before that wave hit Canada. So uh, we, thankfully everything kind of worked out. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we had a place in downtown Toronto. We're able to sell that. And then, you know, the the worry of like, are we going to be able to get a house in, in, in Ottawa, and sure enough, we found one in Canada in Beaverbrook, and it was one of the selling points is that it was walking distance from friends of ours that we had there, and they got two dogs. We have one dog. It's a marriage made happen. So so many, great. yeah, so many parks and great walks in right. that area for sure. I've By been. the way, the name of this podcast on the Canada on the Rocks, I had no idea how many rocks there were in Canada. Like yeah. every, like in our it's, like in our it's, neighborhood, it's insane. every yard is proud of the boulder that they have on their it's lawn. Insane. It's amazing. It's crazy. Well, amazing. that's the whole premise of why I called the show Canada yeah, on the Rocks yeah. because if you were to dig about maybe four or five feet in Canada, mm-hmm. you're bound to hit rocks. Absolutely, no matter what. Yeah. Like uh, I remember back in the day, I was working down the street on Leggett, Leggett mm-hmm. Drive, and then we moved over to Hines, and it's just like a, in that sort of industrial area in right. Canada. And uh, Sienna, the, the company, decided to rebuild the, this, this new complex that they have just right before the pandemic. And the blasting was nonstop. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. We're talking like six or seven times a day. Mm-hmm. Boom. Yep. Boom. Yep. All of that just so they can actually build the exactly. foundation. Yeah. So and hence it, why the show is called Canada on the Rocks. Everywhere you go. And like I feel like kind of bad for our house because we don't really have a large boulder. So it's kind of like it's like I feel kind of insignificant <laughs> in the neighborhood. It's like... <laughs> Oh, you know, the, the, they got the a Lobermans have than a me. much larger rock. That, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So now we're thinking of getting a new rock. Maybe I don't know. That's you know. one of those pet rocks. I yes, think. exactly. Yeah. It was but, something with a speaker in it. That but these, be... <laughs> <laughs> but these ones are really hard to move though. Like they're oh yeah, yeah, massive. Yeah, yeah. My buddy showed me a picture of 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 his old place because he lived just uh, around the corner. They mo- they moved out, but um, they were having some 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 water issues. They're like, what's going on? And then he showed me the picture of like, oh, I wonder what this is. And then it was this boulder about this twice the size of the of your table here that he had to lift out after that. It's like they're everywhere. Right? Yeah. And like friends of ours are trying to dig a pool. And so like, you know, as soon as I think, think, okay, that's it. That's as far as you can go. Yeah. And then sometimes they actually like, believe it or not, I've seen some basements where the basement is half a basement. It's not a full basement. Correct. Yes. And I was like, why? Yeah. Well, you go downstairs and watch, uh-huh. and then it's like it's basically they hit rock. Okay, well, right. we're not, not going to blast. This is going to cost us like yeah. tens of thousands of dollars just to be able to get those couple of rocks. One of my uh, my my brother lives out in Alberta, and one of the first places that he got um, when he went into his basement, it was three quarters three quarter uh, walls because there was a rock that came right in. So they just like instead of blasting it, it was like 
you know, let's Austin. let's just walk around the bull, you know. So yeah. they just built onto this rock, and so like very cool in this in the summer, yeah. you know. <laughs> and that's the thing too, like the the they tend not to move. Like rocks at the end of the For day, sure. they're very For solid, sure. unless you're sitting on like a fault line or mm-hmm. which all of Ottawa is, but right. that's a different story. For sure, um, they they tend to be very solid. It's not like building on sand where it's right. going to start, you know, sinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I'm sorry, is this a geology? podcast i no, didn't know no, that. okay it's, all it's, right. it's, we're, just, we're trying to be funny here. okay <laughs> <laughs> why so, did you bring me then that's the, 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 as soon as you said it's like one of the funniest yeah. people i've seen in Ottawa was like you gotta see more people buddy <laughs> oh my god so tell me about comedy what Ooh. got you started in comedy why toronto and when i was a kid things that i always wanted to watch was was comedy of, of any sort of form yeah right? because like you know just the the, the ability for someone you know, in a studio thousands of miles away to be able to look into a camera and make people laugh in a, in a, in a living room. That's a very powerful thing. Mm-hmm. And one of the first albums that I ever bought, I think I was like 10 years old, was an album called Just for Laughs. Nice. And it was not, this predates the festival. Yeah. And it was just like a KTEL album of like comedy. Like just, like not just stand up, like it had some stand up. It had Richard Pryor and, and early George Carlin and Flip Wilson and, and that sort of thing. But it also had like, it kind of sketch and improv, so they had like Jonathan Winters on there. They had Abbott and Costello, George Burns and and Gracie, like like all these kind of really really key sketches and uh, and, and comedy bits. And I kind of fell in love with it. And I would just mm-hmm. listen to it like all the time. And I kind of grew up with that. So like you know, any time that there was comedy on the TV, I was going to watch it. So, you know, when I got old enough, I would start taping Letterman. I would look for you know anyone that's going to be on the Tonight Show and that sort of thing. And Actually, Ottawa plays a big role in how I started, and it was when I was 16, we took a family holiday to Ottawa from Gananoque. Our cottage at the time was on the Rideau River, so like when my mom said, we're going to Ottawa for a holiday, it's like, we boat there for ice cream. What are you doing? Yeah, exactly. So, okay, fine. So we go there, and my mom picks up the Things to Do in Ottawa magazine that's in the hotel. And I'm like, well, this, and I'm 16-year-old, and I'm just, you know, just ignorant of everything like you know i was just a huge huge pain in the arse and so like you know listen to my walkman i'm just i don't want to be there like this whole thing and my mom looks and goes oh there's someone at the nac i'm like oh this will be great because i'm thinking it's gonna be like ann murray or something like that like something they really enjoy it's like jay leno i was like we're going it was like what it's like it's, it's first of all his name's jay leno and we're going and my parents are like well, i don't know if we can we should do this you know yeah, they're yeah. worried of like you know, trust me trust me we're going because i had seen him he was he was like a regular guest on letterman at the time you know he had you know i don't think he had been co-hosting tonight show at that point but he he was a lot of people make fun of jay leno now because he's kind of turned into sort of a caricature of himself and you know just does cars and, and, and you know i never spend my tonight show money it's like whatever mm-hmm. he used to be the guy like he's he one of the funniest people he, i've ever what? He, he used to be the alternative guy. Like he was the guy that got angry at uh, you know airline food, and you know. But like back then, because comedy was was still sort of germinating and, and becoming more mainstream, he was really sort of like that that alternative voice. I know it's hard to believe, and you know people you may not believe this, but it is true. He he sort of was the was the was a crotchety old guy that would come on TV and, and tell you what's right. So I went, okay, I you know, corralled my parents like, let's go do this. And so we sat in like the back row, the last the last seats we could get were like the back row of the NAC in the in the huge theater. Mm-hmm. And I watched him perform for over an hour and a half, like probably close to two hours, where he did regular stand up bits, but then did crowd work, which back then was actual crowd work as opposed to what you're seeing now on YouTube. Or uh, in TikTok, he would just go through the first three rows of the audience and go, "What's your name? What do you do? Joke. What's your name? What do you do? Joke. What's your name? What do you do? Call back to that guy. Joke. 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 Like it was phenomenal. And that that was when I went, "Oh, this can be done." So that's that's yeah. cool. And so as weird as it sounds, Gananoque, a town of 5,200 people, didn't have a thriving comedy community. No. So no. no they, why? Why? Why is that? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, you get no just funny have, bones up. No, there. you just you just have bottles thrown at you at the pro. So so I went to University of Waterloo and I was stranded one day at um, Thanksgiving. My ride kind of fell through, and they weren't picking me up until the next day. And all my friends had bugged out of town, so I'm like, I got nothing to do. So I'll go downtown see if I can get into trouble, like whatever. By that definition, is I'm going to go to the record store. So I went mm-hmm. to the record store, and as I'm walking down the street, I see a sign. It's, it's like a neon sign. It's kind of like you know the Holy Grail. 
uh, light in, uh, in, in the movie, it said Yuck Yucks. And I went, oh, my God, there's a comedy club. So I ran. Nice. Do it right, just bolt a bolt a bolt, and like I'm breathless and I'm standing at the box. I'm gonna go, Are you sold out tonight? And she's like, No, it's Thanksgiving. It's like, it's Nobody's like, here. It's like, Can I get a ticket? It's like, When's the next show? It's like, It starts in half an hour. Can I get a ticket? Yes, okay, thank you. And that was my first show. That was my first show, and I went every week there. And I brought friends with me, but like, I just I watched live comedy constantly and, and got to know some of the comics as well. And then by the, the end of that semester, I was going to, I was coming to Ottawa for a, a co-op term for, from university. And I said, hey, before I leave, do you mind if I do like five minutes of stand-up? They were like, absolutely, sure. Because they had, I'd gotten to know the staff and everything. They're like, you have to do. So I did the first show and it went okay. And, they, and then they said, so you want to stay for the second show? I was like, yes. So I got to do two sets in, in one night after all my exams were done. And then I came to Ottawa and look for the comedy club here. There's a Yuck Yucks here because at that point that was the only franchise in Canada. Mm -hmm. There was only, and and they were all across Canada. And uh, the Ottawa system, the guy that owns the club still owns it here, uh, Howard Wagman, and he really was able to nurture the the local comedy scene. And uh, a lot of the other clubs were kind of directed by the mothership in Toronto, how to do their business stuff like that. Whereas Howard, because he was kind of so secluded, you know, in terms of distance away from from the, you know, you really had to drive there to, to get there. He was able to chart his own path and he was able to book his own shows kind of, uh, you know, in the neighborhood under the under the guise of Yuck Yucks, but he was able to foster his young talent that, yeah. that was that was local. And out of that scene, to be fair, came Mike McDonald, Jeremy Hotz, Norm McDonald, and countless others that I'm I'm now forgetting. But but those those are the guys that kind of came through the Ottawa system and became huge. Like they they were massive talents. And a lot of it is in, in helpful in part to having that, that ability to, to germinate and, and kind of work on your craft away from the, uh, the prying eyes of like larger communities. I mean, like when uh, one of the biggest pieces of advice that a lot of comics get when they're thinking of making the jump to, to New York or LA is like, I wanna go. It's like, well, then make sure you're the king of the castle of where you are living. Mm -hmm. Because when you get there, you're starting from nothing. So you have to prove yourself. So like if you're brilliant in Chicago, you better be brilliant in Chicago because when you come to New York or you come to LA, no one's heard of you and you've got to do that. And same thing goes everywhere. So like I've got friends of mine that, that have moved to the States. Many of them have been able to plot that course because they were really good here in Toronto and they're really good in Vancouver and, and, and Ottawa and they were able to hold their own. I have other friends that did not make that. Mm -hmm. you know, they, it's just, you know, they, they weren't ready or LA or New York wasn't ready for them. But for the most part, the friends of mine that have made it down there, they've been successful. And that's, that's been, that's been really good. But yeah, so Howard, um, had like an open mic system here. Like a, there was a, I think it was after the Thursday shows, they would put on the amateur, the, the amateur night, which was like all the locals, uh, amateurs. We were able to get on that. By the time I got back to Waterloo, the club there had adopted that framework and now we're doing their own open mics uh, after shows. So I was able to, between those two cities, really kind of work on work on my craft and that sort of thing. Um, worked in Gananoque for a, uh, a couple of years and then finally went, uh, where's it better be unemployed, Gananoque mm -hmm. or Toronto? So I moved to Toronto and, and lived there for half my life. Yeah, might as well, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's easy to pick up part-time shifts. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I, liter I literally started in two box offices, and that's where I worked, and then did stand-up uh, all the way through, and um, ended up hosting an open mic myself, because one of the things that, and another great piece of advice for, for comics is if you, if you want to get stage time, make it yourself get your own stage time. Mm -hmm. So go and do, um, uh, you know, find a, find a bar that has like a private room that you can, you can work on so you're not annoying people and so the people that want to see comedy are coming to see that comedy. Do that. Make sure that, you know, you've got the support of the venue that they're going to, you know, at the very least put up posters and go, there's Comedy Thursday, you know, whatever it was. So I had all that and so I was able to build that show up. Became a great show, a great mm -hmm. show in, in, in Toronto and, and Probably one of the reasons is that they discounted booze. <laughs> it was like three dollar bottles and two dollar rails. It's like Might okay, well. all right, yeah, yeah. So, so what what uh, makes a great comic in your opinion? Well, they're usually funny. <laughs> I mean, that is funny business. That's, that's that's probably it. I mean, like it really. It, there, there's so much new definition for funny right now. Mm -hmm. and there's so much different 
there's so many different ways that you can look at comedy because there can be comics out there that will destroy a room and just like are, are on a connective level with the audience and are able to, to, to really kind of get their message across, get their jokes across, that 90% of the people like and then 10% 10 don't. There is so much subjectivity in, in comedy. Of course. It's, it's like anything. It's like, you know, you can be the best chef in the world, but if you put a plate of tomatoes in front of someone who hates tomatoes, they're not going to. What makes them funny, I think, is just the, the, conf the confidence in person. I think the, the establishment of their voice, knowing their voice, and being able to kind of put everything through that prism and go, this is how I see it. This is how I am going to get people to see it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's how it works. I mean, the I think when, when comedy doesn't work, I think you can see it as, at any point when you look at a, a comic and go, do you really think that? And then that, that, that can kind of, you can kind of start picking at the threats. The, when the, the comedy bubble burst in the early night, late nineties, early before that, where there's too many comedy clubs, because they popped up everywhere. Comedy was on yeah. TV all over the place. And there wasn't enough talent to fill that void. The demand really over, uh, overtook the supply. So that's why it kind of collapsed. Now, with the way that people communicate, the way that people consume their media through TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, you and there is now so much exposure to the world of comedy out there. There's a huge boom right now, and people are always going to burst. And it's like, I don't think it's going to burst. And one of the reasons I don't think it's going to burst is because everyone has now become so reliant on their own likes and dislikes that they're able to find whatever they want mm -hmm. so if you type into google i want to see a one-armed polynesian comedian and then suddenly you've got this guy in the luau chuckle hut, uh, chuckle hut mm -hmm. uh you know going hey let me tell you why i look like a slot machine and that is like that's all like you can <laughs> find whatever you want like like comedy has become forgive the term but it's become so fetishized that you can find exactly the type of comedy that you want and then because there's so many channels of distribution for comedy and for media, you're able to go, oh, that's the thing I like. You're able to put your message out there yeah. and garner an audience that way. And I think that works for an awful lot of people. I think a lot of people have, uh, the, as, as much as he gets slammed in the business previously and even today still, Dane Cook was the guy that kind of first harnessed that. He showed he showed he the way care, yeah. of like, hey, here's my space. And if you don't, what my, don't know what my space is, ask your parents. Um, to ask their parents because they'll know. MySpace was the you know the pre Facebook hey you know in you know connectivity of of people and he overtook that platform. And you you even see now like the different people that overtake the platform like in, in the early days of Twitter you could see Rob Delaney taking over Twitter and just like you know putting out jokes like oh my God people can do that and then it really allowed the the cream to kind of rise to the top in terms of like what you saw in terms of like the quality of comedy and, and and what was out there but it also helped increase the search parameters so you could find the things that you wanted if you wanted more lgbtq comedy you were able to find it if you wanted to find more bipoc comedy you're able to find that mm -hmm. first nations comedy you're able to find that and i don't think that's a bad thing it's you know you're you're able to find your audience and you're able to find and, and expand that audience and have people go, oh, I didn't know that this was going. It works the other way, too, in the live setting where people see you and go, oh, how do I find out about you? And it used to be that you just waited until their name was on a marquee and go, oh, here, they're back. Now you can go, oh, I know they're coming in September because I'm on their website. I yeah. follow them on socials. Yeah. I'm, able to, I'm able to find the thing. So the means of communication with your audience have increased tenfold, hundredfold um, since the days of just you know waiting to see who shows up at a comedy club yeah so it's, it's funny to say that because i was like for the longest time i've always looked to see for example egyptians or mm -hmm. palestinians that yeah. are comics right and i follow some of them now yeah i'm actually going to see sam oh yeah uh, yeah he's coming in october i, I saw that yes so I, and it's because i'm following him mm -hmm. on instagram and yeah. it's just that that's how i knew about it yeah i didn't know that you know that that kind of comic existed 10 years ago right mm -hmm. like so it's, it's kind of funny to kind of put that in perspective yeah. that, you know, with the advent of all of the mm -hmm. technologies available for yep. us, we're able to kind of harness exactly what we're looking for. There's, there's also ways that you can package yourselves. I mean, like when you look at the Blue Collar Comedy Tour, that was one of the things. The Axis of Evil Comedy Tour was another thing where mm -hmm. it, was, it was all Arabic comics. And then there's like all kinds of like LGBTQ comedy out there yeah. as well that, you know, they, they, especially during Pride, like a, a few of my friends that, uh, that are in the community, 
they're putting on, you know, gay and trans shows for their community. And so the, it, it becomes sort of like these these lovely banners that you can you can go to. Oh, this is this. I enter, I identify with this. Yeah. I'm going to go to this because it speaks to me specifically. So it's yeah, you're able to kind of find your tribe in a way. Yeah. In one way or another. And then that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of the times and, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you getting on stage, the first thing you guys do is gauge the audience. Mm hmm. Tell me a little bit more about your experience with that. What, engaging the audience? Gauging the oh, audience. Oh, so gauging it. type of sort of audience? There is of? one thing that I have grown. There's there's a few things, like, as, as you go and do this more and more, you have your own picadillos about, about things that you like and don't like about mm -hmm. the shows. And one of the things that drives me nuts is when you have acts on the show, like comedians, that don't watch the show because you don't know what has happened before you've gotten onto that stage. Correct. So one of the things I do, uh, and I've been doing recently, is to uh, audiences, uh, typically, they, they, they're not just a group of people. They're an organism onto themselves. And one of the things they want, they, they want to be entertained, obviously. That is, that is key. If you're, if you're not going to be funny, that's going to be horrible. But they want to know that you see them. Mm -hmm. And that you, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got, like on a third hand, was um, they want to like you. They just need to know that you like them. Mm -hmm. So once you do that, once you bridge that, it's like, okay. And there's so much, there's so, the, the, the first joke that you do on stage, I've always kind of referred to it as the handshake. You're basically handshaking the audience. And there's so much that needs to be detailed in that handshake. It needs to go high. First of all, like it's an introduction. You need to instill on in into them that I got this, right? Don't worry, we're all good. You need to also sort of give them a telegraph of what sort of comedy they're in for in the in the first little while. And just giving them the confidence to know that, oh, he's funny. She's funny. They're funny. Make sure that that that, that is yeah. that that is tantamount. So there's a lot riding on that opening joke, that opening moment. But one of the things that they also want is is, is recognition. They want to want to be able to know that oh okay. And like if you're going to like a um, a small town or a play, or a place that's that's, uh, that's very specific, maybe it's a fundraiser or an organization is putting on the show, or you're going to you know small town rec center and they're putting on the show and that sort of thing. They want to know that you see them. And so like a opening joke or salvo of like um i see you i recognize you i see i see what's going on helps and perfect example of this um i was going back home to do a show in gananoque so i was going back to my hometown i was going to do it a friend of mine was opening for me he had never been to gananoque before so he's like so we're driving there and i'm like he he says to me um i want you to help me with an opening joke I'm like okay uh, what, what do you want he says i want something local that they will understand. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. And I thought for a second, I went, okay, I want you to say this. And it's like, I was really happy to be in Gananoque. Todd was very proud of this town. So he took me around to all the, the hot sites in Gananoque. And then you pause for a bit and go, so we're leaving Donovan's Hardware, right? Donovan's Hardware is like a small mom and pop hardware shop. It's just yeah. like, and it's on the main street. Everyone knows where it is. You go there, it's like, um, I had broken the top of a percolator coffee machine. And my girlfriend from Toronto at the time, she was like, oh, you're never going to find new ones. I said, I'll wait till I get home. They'll have it. She's like, no, they won't. Walked into Donovan's Hardware, and I said, hi, do you got the little glass toppers for, uh, for like, a percolator? He goes, yeah, what color do you want? And he takes me over. There's, like, a rack of, like, five of them. So he's like, ha-ha, you're not going to be my it. girlfriend for long. <laughs> and that was true. So my buddy's like, are you sure that's going to be the joke? Are you sure? Like, a, a hardware just like, trust me, trust me. So he goes up before me. And he starts into the joke as, hi, you know, Todd's very proud of this town. So, like, he wanted to take me to all the hot spots. And he paused and goes, so we're leaving Donovan's Hardware. And he was blown backwards by the roar of laughter that hit him. And he looked over me. I just went, see, told you. Like, they just wanted to be seen. They want to recognize that you see them for yeah, yeah. all the kind of the dumb things that they do. And so I will I will try and do that. Like, like in, in a show and getting back to, like, when comics don't aren't aware of the show, when they, you know, they're in the back. They're in the green room. They're on their phones. They're you know you know drinking at the the bar and go. Oh, am I up? Okay, and then they go. 
you can miss so much. And one of the things that bugs me is that if someone's gone up before them and has talked to the front row, let's say, and there's a doctor there. So, oh, what kind of doctor are you? Oh, you're, you're, you're a, a, an oncologist. Okay, well, that, thank you for sucking the funny out of the room, you know, because that's, you know, nothing funny about oncology, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you do that, and then two acts later, another comic comes on and they go, hey, what do you do for a living? Because, oh, I'm a doctor. What kind of a doctor are you? Oncologist, like the audience has already seen that. Like they know. Like, is, uh, were you like not paying attention? Yeah. 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 So I will sometimes like go and take this thing out of the room. And you know what? Wait and see, like sort of like what interactions have happened with the comics, and I'll just recap the night that's happened. So let me get this straight: we've got a birthday over here, we've got this guy who has no idea why he's here, and this person from Germany who is understanding every third word. Am I caught up? And it's like, and that, then the audience goes, "Oh, he's in the room. Like he's he's, yeah, he's aware. He's with, he's with us." Yeah. And it's like, okay, now what? You know? So and just something simple like that, like just that that initial connection, just to show that oh, he's aware, he knows what's going on, he knows what's the scores. We're good. Yeah, we're good. It, it, there's something to be said about people like they just want to be heard. Mm. They just want to be understood. Yeah. And and sometimes it's just a, an acknowledgement like this is just saying that, like, I got you. Like yeah. you said, I got you. Mm -hmm. it, it's really what sets you apart as a comic, I think. Yeah. Some of the funniest acts starts with the engagement, for me yep. at least, like when I'm, when I'm there. And like, I'll give you a very simple one. This is back probably, I'm dating myself here, 2003, my... Uh, my ex and I were going to one of our first comedy shows mm -hmm. at Absolute. Yeah. You know, the comic that was on stage, I can't remember. He, some, like, I think he's from Toronto, Indian background. Like, I can't remember. He's a bit famous now. I just don't remember. Russell Peters. I don't think it's Russell Peters. <laughs> <laughs> but that's close. Oh, Sugar Sammy, maybe? Maybe. I think it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's Sugar Sammy. Sugar actually. Sammy. And he was like, starting out at the, at the point. And he just, the first thing he did is reading the room. And he goes, oh, I've got the immigrant table out here. Because mm -hmm. all of us are... Arabs, yeah, and you know a couple of white girls sitting with us, mm -hmm. kind of, right. and he goes, uh, so what's the situation here? And then he's like, oh, dating, okay, first date, oh, a couple of dates, okay, great, and then he's, he went on and he goes, have she met your parents yet? Oh, she hasn't, and and the, just the whole yeah. audience just went laughing, and like my face was obviously red. Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. And going, this guy understood me, like, yep, you know, and, and I felt like I belong in the room, mm -hmm. and then like you know, just like the feeling like you know what like he knows what's going on yeah and i was listening and i'm like i've literally been watching his career for the last little mm -hmm. bit just because of that yeah he was the when toronto opened up the the absolute comedy there he was the first act on that stage mm -hmm. so it was that night and they they put him up and i had just gone to support and i was the third act and they just because the owner just went hey do you want to do some time and i'm like what do you think like i am notorious for like Someone will come in and, and like one of the comments will go, I had the worst show last night. It was at this Legion. They threw darts at me. They wouldn't turn the stereo off. The uh, TVs were blaring. The food was horrible. I tried to do 20 minutes. They only let me do 10 because they, you know, they threw a chair at me. And uh, I would just go, who books that? Mm -hmm. You know, because I'll do it. I don't, I don't care. I have no compunction to not do, not do a spot. But like, yeah. And that is... It's, I mean, practice makes the impossible, in my it opinion. It does, it does, but I, I should really say no at some point. <laughs> I really should. Yeah. I don't, but, but yeah, like, like Sugar Sammy is, is, is a king of that. He's, he's, he's able to, like, read a room. As well, my buddy in, is bilingual, so is Sugar Sammy, so they were doing shows in Montreal completely in French, and so mm -hmm. my buddy translated his act into French so that he could, he could work with him, and it's just, it's insane seeing the different cultures like even in this country of how they admire and respect comedy like for if you put up a show in english canada it'll run like a week maybe like you know you might get a tuesday through sunday of a, of a stand-up show and that sort of thing unless it's part of a festival whereas in montreal they just kept booking weeks and weeks and weeks. he was gone for like four to six weeks because it was all french comedy like they, there's so much respect and admiration for mm -hmm. comedy in, in in quebec for for french language comedy they adore it and like they've got like a rich rich history in in clown and sketch and, and stand up like they they really the the the, the french community really kind of you know grabs it and holds on and they're like oh yeah we really want uh, want you really appreciate it todd lots to bring to the table lots for the audience to watch and uh, comedy in ottawa is growing so fast it's been growing for the last 20 years yeah. or so again thank you for being one of the funniest people on the show oh, come on. and uh, for folks that are watching if you like what you see uh, to continue getting th those episodes please hit the like button subscribe and hit the bell icon as well too 
so many different episodes are coming, so many different uh, people, business people here in the city that uh, we can bring. And if you have anybody that you're thinking of, don't forget to comment. It's a fantastic way for us to, you know, go out and figure out who's else in the city that we can bring, the shakers and the movers and the funny people as well. Thanks again.